In this edition of Lunch with Legends, so you think you know everything about Dodger baseball? Well, unless your name is Mark Langell, you don't. More about the Herald of Dodger historian in a bit, but I know I thought I knew a lot about the Dodgers, but even this old Dodger dog learned quite a bit from the KCET documentary, Dodger Stories, Six Decades in L.A., which premieres Thanksgiving Thursday night, November 28th at 8.30 on KCET. KCET's president and CEO Andy Russell says Dodger Stories is an L.A. story. When you think about those kind of stories, uh, up near the top is, is stories about the Dodgers. So this is exactly the kind of films that we should be uh, making and, and telling because we're telling stories about communities. And, of course, we're telling it in our way, uh, which is about history and about personal connections and personal stories and stories of our community. Dodger Stories producer Maura Finney wove the stories together for six decades in L.A. as only KCED can, which makes this a perfect show for people who don't even like baseball. This was something I completely wanted to do. Nobody said, go make a Dodger show. It was just, it seemed like there were so many great stories and nobody really done anything at this level of depth about the history. Um, so, yeah, it, it's been a lot of fun to learn more about it and the work of the Dodgers. People, they've been great. Um, Mark Langell's just, you know, it's very easy to interview. You ask him one question, he talks for 10 minutes. So, same with Roz Wyman. You know, so with, between the two of them, I knew if I could interview the two of them, the rest of it was going to be sort of gravy. After a screening of Dodger Stories, Six Decades in L.A., at the L.A. Central Public Library, there was a panel discussion featuring former Dodger, Arizona State, and Dominguez High star Kenny Landro, producer Maura Finney, Former L.A. City Councilwoman Rosalind Wyman, who, as a newly elected 22-year-old, wouldn't take no for an answer from Walter O'Malley, and Mark Langell, who moderated. With permission from KCET, here is that panel discussion, which gives you a taste of what the film is like. Please welcome former L.A. Councilwoman and Southern California icon Rosalind Wyman. And my first question has to be for Roz because Roz, 60 years, and here we are. And what emotions do you get uh, when you talk about the Dodgers in terms of uh, what this franchise has met? You see in the film, they talk of now generations, not just the first generation of Dodger fans, but we're on the second, the third, the fourth. Uh, what do the Dodgers mean to Roz Wyman? I mean a lot. I wish they win a World Series. <laughs> That would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, there's a lot of emotions when I talk or think about the Dodgers. It's certainly been a big part of my life. And um, I always, always feel that if a elected official can do something that's left after they're long under or up above, who knows, uh, that we can give something that is left to the community and I must say, Mark, when we talked about the Dodgers coming, we didn't even know if they'd be successful. Four million people this year. I guess somebody loves them. And, and um, we didn't know about it, but as, as laughing, you're talking about the weather. Um, I'm, I don't know what we're going to talk about, but one of the last things I said to Walter O'Malley before we went to vote in the city council, not knowing if I had 10 votes, you know, I made all these great arguments, you know, to get them here and how it was important for the city, be good for the taxi, be good for restaurants, good for, uh, we took a survey and we had the 500 uh, great uh, 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 companies here during that period. By the way, we don't have one right now. And so they'd taken a survey to see what, people wanted to come to work to L.A., and one of the things a lot of people said, we'd like to have good sports, we'd like to have good arts, etc. And the last day, if, I don't know if we'll get to that story, but the last day of the vote, uh, the mayor wanted me to talk to O'Malley, and it's why I didn't want to, I may get into tonight before we took our last vote, and he just kept getting, trying to get to me finally got me down to his office, and instead of the mayor talking to him to find out if he wanted to come, he gives me the phone. And I said, I didn't want to know because if I had to go back to the city council and I didn't have a yes, 
I could lose votes. So, I mean, I had never spoken to Mr. O'Malley. It was hard to believe because of all the negotiations. He had his people here. And I'm on the phone, and he says to me, the last thing he says to me, you know, I'm a New Yorker, and I love New York. And he tried to uh, build a stadium in New York. And uh, one of the things, I couldn't think of what to say to him, you know, at that moment. And you know what I said? We doesn't rain much in California. You won't have rain outs. <laughs> so <laughs> how many we had, 16? 18? We, we haven't had a rain out since April the 17th, 2000. But how many total? 18? We've only had 18. 18 in all these years. I was right. I was right about something. <laughs> well, I have a lot of emotions. I don't know where to go to, but we have a good panel, so I'm sure you'll ask me some questions and may will lead me there. There was a big fight. I was very pregnant at the same time, my first child, and I would go to the the doctor and you know they wanted to take radio shows or television shows and there I was laying on the table with this doctor over me and I was doing a radio show because <laughs> because I couldn't you know I had to be on the floor of the city council and I went from the city council um, that's a story in itself to the doctor for the last time and I must say I wanted to go to opening day and my doctor I had miscarried and they were I was supposed to be careful during this period they brought a couch up which I never used do you know how to be careful what <laughs> anyway <laughs> what was I? <laughs> oh yeah so anyway I had to be careful during the pregnancy and he said I said I'm saying to him I want to go to opening day and he said to me, Roz, you haven't done anything right that I've asked you to do this time around. And he said, we're not going to talk about opening day. And I said, you can't, you know, if it comes and it's close. And in those days, women didn't leave the hospital the next day. They kept you and kept you. And anyway, I wasn't happy about it. We're getting closer and closer. And finally, um, I... I <laughs> My husband, we thought I might be in having uh, pains that you have before you have babies. And he said, I said, Jean, uh, I have to go to downtown and I have to I have to be there. And he said, well, it's very strange. But I said, well, I, you know, it's going to take a while with these pains, I'm told, etc." <laughs> So anyway, I left for downtown and my seatmate got a call. And uh, he, he, Gene told him that I was in labor. And my seatmate said, are you in? He came back and he patted my hand. And I mean, they're old enough to be my father, or my grandfather. So, you know, there's some of them like me, some of them didn't. But anyway, uh, he patted my hand and he said, are you in labor? And I said, yeah, I think so. And he said, we had what was called where the public came to talk and speak about issues, and it was, you have a time li uh, element involved. And so he, my Jean said, I can't get down. If she has to go to the hospital, will you take her? And my seatmate was not very excited about that either. And so he went to the president of the council, and the president of the council said, call, came over, left the seat, came over to me and said, Rosie, you and labor and I said yes but keep going here and so anyway they called the fire department and <laughs> they had a fireman sitting out there waiting for me and so my the doctor said to me I went to the doctor and he said well you're really close and I said well I want to go to the game can I go then and he said well not unless we have it right away and I took I, this is you I'm really sharing something I highly love he said there's an old wives tale he said doesn't work if you take castor oil maybe it'll happen you can move it along so i took the castor oil <laughs> <laughs> and i never told my husband until he came home and he said well do we go to the hospital and i said yeah i think we better go to the hospital and so i gave birth and what i did was the funny part of the story was the doctor wanted to go to opening day, but he was going to keep me from going. 
that couldn't happen. So, so what I did was I got, uh, he said, Roz, you've got to stay home. You haven't done anything right so far. And he said, there was a parade, and I wanted to go on the parade. I'm going to turn down sitting with Sandy Koufax and Don Drysdale. I hope you all know those names. Anyway, in the parade, and I thought, I'm not going to give that, that up. So anyway, I arranged to have him get tickets. So he calls me very sheepishly, and he says, well, you can go because I'm going to be in the stadium. And if anything happens, I'll just come get you <laughs> with 50,000 people. So anyway, uh, that, was opening, that was opening day in the Coliseum. I got to go. My doctor went until he died. He never found out what I did to get him tickets so I could go. That, that, that is why I have the greatest job in the world, because in five decades of research, Roz Wyman and Castor Oil, opening day Coliseum, and the behind-the-scenes secrets of how she got there, you see the photos, uh, and that's the great thing, too, just like the fans in the uh, film, just telling these stories, and this is what makes it so rich, just like a quilt that never ends. Now, Kenny Landro, just the other day, you were at the Dodger Thanksgiving celebration for the community, and Kenny is a big part of the community department, and you're giving out uh, turkeys and, and assisting. And I wonder, you've been associated with the club for so long. You haven't played in a major league uniform uh, since the end of the 87 season. And I was doing the math, and it's a high number, and, but, you're still, <laughs> but you're still just associated. Kenny Landro, uh, L.A. Dodger, and if you uh, rub your beard for a second... Uh, you can show, that's it, show off the ring, casually, yeah, oh. yeah, <laughs> yeah, he, he wasn't doing that backstage, but he gets on the stage, and suddenly something has to be done with the, <laughs> Kenny, tell me what, tell me about your association with the Dodgers as far as you've got that ring, but just Kenny Landro Dodgers, what that means to you? This ring right here? No, be, be, well, the ring, and obviously he's holding the microphone with the right hand, so you can see. <laughs> Uh, you'll be able to see the ring all during his answer, but what what do the Dodgers mean to Kenny Landro in terms of your lifelong association? Well, the, the Dodgers, I go way back with the Dodgers. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, the Dodgers have been a part of my life since 1958. Um, 1958 was the first um, Major League Baseball game I ever went to. Um, they were playing in the Coliseum. My dad, my uncles, once again, they they took me to a baseball game at the Coliseum. And I forgot the gentleman's name that he, he said he went to the game at the Coliseum. We were sitting so high up also. <laughs> it's like we was watching the game from a helicopter or airplane also. <laughs> you know, but we were at the game. And that was very, man, that was very intriguing to me because I think that night, uh, or, or that day, it was, it was ninety-two thousand, maybe a hundred and two thousand. I mean, it was so many people at that game, and and I remember asking my dad, it's "Like, <clears throat> all of these people are here to watch those guys down there?" He goes, "Yes." He goes, "Yes." That is our new professional team. I said, Los Angeles has a professional baseball team. That's our baseball team now. And those that they're going to be called the Los Angeles Dodgers. And they came from New York, and they're going to be the Los Angeles Dodgers. And, and I, I was like, wow. You think I can play for the Dodgers one day? He goes, well, I don't know. What do you think? You like baseball? I said, yeah, I think, I think I do like baseball. He said, well, you better start practicing. And um, from that point on, you know, from that game on, man, the, the Dodgers have always been a part, a part of my life. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I can remember when I first started playing baseball, uh, you had to be seven years old. And I was six years old. And I wanted to play so bad, I lied about my age. <laughs> and, and believe it or not, the park that I first started playing at was Roy Campanella Park. Um, they had built a park in Compton 
uh, and then named it after Roy. And also at that park, <coughs> when, I, when I first started playing there, they would also the Dodgers would all the Dodgers would also have like uh, clinics there. I remember going to that park, Roy coming to the park, and doing a clinic with Johnny Roseboro, Tommy Davis, Maury Wills, uh, you know Willie Davis. All these, all these guys would come to Roy Campanella Park. As a matter of fact, um, I'm trying to think, I wonder if Steve, well, Steve Garvey came to Roy Campanella Park before. Probably not. No, it wasn't Steve. No, he was, he was too young. Yeah, but no, it was, it was mostly, uh, it was mostly the guys uh, that I remember in the '60s, maybe early '70s, but. Um, that's when I first started playing baseball at Roy Campanella Park. And once again, the Dodgers was a big influence on that. And as I continued to play baseball, and I, I can remember going, go, coming home from the park uh, or coming home and listening to Dodger baseball because my uncles and, and, and my dad, they were so big on baseball, and, <clears throat> and they would always listen to the Dodgers on the radio. And I can remember so many nights, man, just laying down and going to sleep to get ready for school the next day, listening to the Dodger games. I, I had two other brothers, and, you know, we all – we had bunk beds, so all three of us was in the same room. And we were sitting there and listening to the, uh, Vin Scully announce the games. And it was just amazing, man. I said, God, man. I wonder what it's like to be a professional baseball player, you know, and <clears throat> listening to Vince Scully just announced those names. And I, and I was thinking, God, I want, maybe one day, I hope, I hope one day, maybe I get to hear Vince Scully say my name. And so, um, continued to play baseball th throughout, you know, little league, middle school, high school, on, on into college. Um, I did play. I played all sports, though, believe it or not. I, I, I loved sports, basketball, football, baseball, track. I, I, I ran. I did all of them. But for some reason, baseball really intrigued me. And that probably has something to do with the Dodgers. Ever since the Dodgers came from Brooklyn to L.A., baseball seemed to take a priority over basketball and, and football. So I always wanted to see just how good I can get at baseball. And I continued to play baseball all the way from high school into college. Um, fortunate for me, um, I got a chance to go to college. Uh, I wanted to go to USC. But Rod Dato took too long to come and recruit me, so I ended up going to Arizona State. I'm a, I'm a sun devil. And up, and up to this day, uh, Rod Dato, uh, bless his soul, uh, and Justin, every time they, I remember every time Rod used to see me, man, he used to always tell me, you know what, Tiger, I'm mad at you. I am so mad at you. I said, what do you mean? He said, you know you should have been a Trojan. I said, well... I'm a sun devil, man. <laughs> you know, uh, they came, they came, they came first, and my dad didn't want me to stay in LA. He wanted me out of his house, so <laughs> he <t> he <laughs> said, "Nope, you go ahead, uh, go ahead out of, out of state, and you know, you learn learn how to take care of yourself and be on your own." He said, "I'm afraid if you go to school here in LA, you'll probably be coming home every other day, bringing laundry and, and asking your mother to do this and do that." You know, <laughs> so. Yeah, but bad, but bad as I wanted to be a Trojan or a Bruin, you know, growing up here in Los Angeles, I ended up being a Sun Devil. And uh, as I was playing baseball in college, and I was always getting informed and talked to the scouts. They, you know, all the scouts started recruiting, and it's like, you know, you. Uh, I had this one super scout ask me, where where would you like to play professional baseball? And I said. And I'm, I'm on, I said, man, Southern Cal, I'm from, from the West Coast. I want to play in Southern California. 
but I wasn't. I guess I wasn't specific enough because uh, I should have. I should have told him, "Yeah, I want to play for the Los Angeles Dodgers," but I just said the West Coast, Southern California, and so that's out of Arizona State. I ended up getting drafted by the Angels in the first round. <laughs> I'm sorry, Ken. It, it, it oh, worked out. Huh? It worked out, Ken. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 I'm like, oh, man, I got the angels. I got drafted by the angels. I'm like, you know what? <laughs> uh, maybe I said, maybe that's my fault. I should have told a scout, you know what? I want to be drafted by the angels, not just Southern California. I guess I was too vague for him or something. But, you know, at that point, you know, God bless me. I was just so happy that I even got drafted because I didn't know if I was going to get drafted because a lot of times <clears throat> the scouts used to always tell me, even in high school, you are a good player, but we don't know if you're big and strong enough to endure a professional season. And so that was one of the reasons why I didn't sign out of high school and went to college so I, so I can get bigger and stronger. And, and it worked out. I did get bigger and stronger because I left high school 5'9", 150 pounds, and then uh, I left out of my junior year in college, I was 5'11", 175 pounds, 180. And uh, I also uh, got stronger because uh, I started lifting weights with the football team. That helped, that helped a lot also. But any, anyway, then when the Angels drafted me, no, no bad. Me we'll we'll stop you there. I don't want you to have any bad memories. Okay. I don't want you to have any trauma on okay. stage. Well, it, okay. it has a happy ending. He goes to the Twins. He's an All Star. Yep. Thirty game hitting streak, and then he goes to the Dodgers. So don't worry about that okay. other part. It, it All worked right. out. Mara, I, Mara. <laughs> <laughs> Mara, I, I had mentioned in the opening as far as all the, the range of the PBS shows, and, and if you anybody watching the TV, she's doing pledge breaks with David Foster or something overseas or special type of uh, projects. It's not just the actual uh, show itself. There's a lot of behind the scenes. And the two questions for you, what made you want to explore the Dodgers but also – in the process of putting this together, it's one thing to say, yeah, the Dodgers have been around a long time. We'd like to do this. During that discovery period, what was that like for you as far as any surprises along the way or something that you didn't expect? There were a lot of surprises. First of all, I should say, as you know, um, making a TV show like this, there's a lot of people involved. And if I, you just indulge me for two seconds here. Some of them are in the audience. So if you worked on the show, if you could stand up, please. You met Andy at the beginning, but our director, Steve Purcell is here, Nicole, Sergey is in the back, Austin, Dwayne Brown, who narrated the show, wave Dwayne. Yeah. Uh, Court, who was our director of photography. So I really, um, you know, I just want to point out that it does take a lot of people. And for most of us, this is not our day job. <laughs> so it was really sort of a passion project. Um, it started because I love baseball. And um, then a couple things happened all at the same time. Um, I met Roz working on a different show about JFK because one of her other many uh, illustrious moments as she hosted JFK's inaugural gala, who knew? So, and then she told me a bunch of the Dodger stories. Um, and then I moved to, to um, S uh, Southern California and decided I should adopt the Dodgers as my team after being a Giants fan growing up. Yeah, I know. Uh, but, um, and then Mark Langell uh, came to one of our Downton Abbey uh, screening parties in costume and entered the costume contest. And he, he came in second. There, there was My a lucky break in show business. Yeah. <laughs> um, a drag queen dressed as Maggie Swiss, uh, Smith's Dowager Countess won. So he came in second. But um, so Mark and I became friends and he started telling me some of the great Dodger stories. And I want to do to do this particular show and include the fan stories because, you know, everybody can just do sort of the the list of the history, but um, people really have an emotional attachment to the Dodgers, and that's why I wanted to, um, you know, to really solicit stories from the fans. And a lot of the people who are in the show are also here, so they should wave too.
What was the biggest surprise? Something that you thought, no way this can be true, and it turned out, by golly, it happened. Um, probably that they um, spray painted Dodger Stadium field the, before the first game with with vegetable dial because it was such a wreck, and actually pulled it off. I mean, you couldn't do this now with with cameras and social media and everybody. And the players didn't know. They walked out on the field, and you know, all of a sudden, all the balls are green. So I was like, <laughs> Roz, tell me about your early days as far as uh, your relationship with Mr. O'Malley. Um, when did you first get the feeling that it was a possibility? Because if you look at the history, you write him, we're busy, we're busy, we're busy. He thinks it's a publicity stunt. Yet you're very persistent. And uh, But I wonder, it's one thing to be persistent, but then another thing to possibly be optimistic and say, hey, we might have a chance at this. And what was the turning point in your mind? Well... Um, when I decided to run for office, I wasn't given a chance in a million. And uh, but and we had, believe it or not, in the primaries, I ran on fifteen hundred dollars, and uh, it was not heard of. But I walked seven hours a day, and I wore up a, a lot of shoes. And in fact, there was a picture in Life magazine when I won of about six, seven pairs of shoes. But uh, you know, I had been in politics a little bit already by then. I had supported a marvelous woman, the first woman who ever ran statewide. And most of you are too young to know the name Helen Gahagan Douglas. But she was yeah. our first. Good. Uh, she was our first. And uh, I really thought that it was uh, my mother loved politics. And as a young person, we sat and watched the Roosevelt uh, fireside chats. And I used to write to him. So I got interested. And it's, it's a very it's a long story. I'm going to try to shorten it. But I decided to run at the last minute, five minutes before the end, the filing date. That's how sure I was about this thing. And um, but I, we didn't have much money, and my mother and dad were druggists, and so we take anything anybody wants to offer. And my my nephew sold polywogs, and for fifteen cents each, my mother was a card player, and on the, she would get from in her days, uh, well before I ran. She would get from the pie companies, and there was uh, 22 stools at the counter. She would get pie pies companies to leave her pies, and she would get the ice cream to leave her ice cream. And they charge 50 cents for or uh, for res uh, for the end of a game. And then she would say, if anybody played, and if they were playing poker, which she really liked the most, she would take 25 cents off of each pot. So that's how we kind of ran that first campaign. But my mother got a delivery once of um, some soap, unpackaged soap. And she said, here, use it in the campaign. And I said, Mom, I can't go door to door, sweaty soap. You're supposed to be clean with soap. You know, what am I going to do with this soap? So we decided that, well, we would package the soap. So we packaged the soap, and the idea was to want to have a clean city, use our soap. So anyway, we packaged it, but there was a little three by five, like a business card. And on that, I checked off, bring Major League Baseball to Los Angeles. I just thought you wrote a letter and said, come. Boy, did I, did I learn. I knew every rule by the time I got done. And I saw that the Braves had moved, the Braves baseball town. And I thought that my city was not a big city unless we had major league sports. And someday I'll share the Lakers story because everybody doesn't know why they're called the Lakers. Well, they came from Minnesota, and that's a whole other story. But anyway, um, we checked off this little thing, and then I thought, well, I saw the Braves move. And I thought, well, maybe some teams are moving around. I must say, till the very end, I didn't think I had a shot to get the Brooklyn Dodgers. They were, everybody, if anybody's from New York and you're old, they still, I can go to a dinner party.
meets how many years. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, but, but anyway, in O'Malley, we start, I started to read that they were landlocked at Ebbets Field, if any of you had been to Ebbets Field. There's no parking at all. I mean, we in L.A., you know, don't have it now. But uh, anyway, I thought, well, what have I got to lose? So I wrote him a letter that I was interested in having Major League Baseball for Los Angeles. And he wrote me not a, the most perfect <laughs> letter back. It said, I am in the middle of preparing for a World Series and I'm terribly sorry I have no time to see you or speak with you. That's a famous letter to this day. And so anyway, but I didn't get too discouraged. So I just kept poking away at it. And <clears throat> I thought that we might have a chance because I then read that O'Malley had tried three different places in Brooklyn or in New York to stay. And by the way, the dumbest thing New York ever did, they not only lost the Dodgers, they lost the Giants too. And that's part of the history of how we, the Dodgers came because we had to have another team for a round robin. And at that point, the furthest team west of, of was the St. Louis Car Cardinals was the furthest team west. And so that if the Dodgers came and you only had three games with them, the Major League Baseball didn't want to approve that then. I mean, you don't know what all this stuff that we went through. And it would take a month for me to tell you the whole story. <laughs> but anyway, um, I kept persisting. But one thing I said, I will not build a stadium if the taxpayers have to pay for it. You have to build a stadium. You have to pay for it because then and tax the land. If they didn't, if we built it, can't tax the land. And so we had land that had just been dormant for five years, and that's another whole story, a part of this. But we had our little bar of soap, we had my check off, and I just wouldn't give up, because I thought, I just believed that it, Major League City had to have Major League Sports. And O'Malley was not easy, but he flew over, uh, the, the, came here for a trip, and he flew over the stadium, and it, it, or the area was built, and there was, a, it looked like a 45 degree angle, and he saw where he could build, and people would just then go to their seats and walk straight out. And he was really smart, and he also had kind of a, specialty in architecture and building. And so without going through all the machinations of getting, and, and it was difficult between getting Major League Baseball, and then what we had to do, we had to get, a we had to get the Giants to move. Now, it wasn't only the Dodgers. We now had to find out that Major League Baseball was not going to approve the Dodgers to come to L.A. after we got the vote, basically. And they, then we went for the Giants. And at one point, uh, uh, the Giants, <laughs> dumbest thing New York ever did was lose not one team, but two teams. But anyway, <laughs> and oh, I was so glad when we took on New York. I can't tell you, I'm a native born, and I so was so sick of hearing, New York has the arts, New York has the music, you know, or has the sports. I don't know, I just got angry, I think. But anyway. <laughs> I was going to make my team better, my city better than New York. And so anyway, um, then what happened was we had to talk to somebody to take Giants. But we found out the Giants were losing money. And so we figured we had a shot because we, if we didn't get it, Major League Baseball wasn't going to say, move Do no, we're going to move the Dodgers. So I had a few friends, was very close to the mayor, who is now, of course, our U.S. Senator, and Diane Feinstein was mayor, and Nancy Pelosi was in that city as well, and um, she uh, was part of when I ran the 84 convention, and she was, uh, I'm a little off on the story because the convention, but I did have a friend in the mayor, and I did have a friend in Nancy Pelosi, but she wasn't what she is today, and anyway, 
uh, we had some friends, so we made some calls to see if we get anybody interested in, <laughs> you want the Dodgers. I talked to some of the most successful people in San Francisco, builders, and everybody I would talk to, Ross, what do we want a baseball team? I'm not interested. But we got, the, Walt, Walter started talking to the Giants, uh, uh, Stoneham, Horace Stoneham. And believe it or not, we, he talked them, and all of us talked them into Great Candlestick Park, which was horrible. <laughs> but, but anyway, really, really, really bad. Yeah. But he he wanted, and when he did his negotiations, he got he want, got the concessions, he got the parking, he he didn't have to pay taxes because it was owned by the city of San Francisco. And so Horace Stoneham ends up going to San Francisco. Now we it looks like we're in business to get the Dodgers to go. And, and that was really big. But at one point, now that I'm so old, I look back. And one thing I really can't believe, at one point the negotiations just stopped. It wasn't looked like we could make all the deals that we wanted to for the land and for the this part and that part. And O'Malley said to us, his, not Walter personally, but the people negotiating said to us, um, how about um, O'Malley's people said, well, we'll take, we, we don't want to negotiate anymore. We, you, we will take the deal that the giants are getting, the concessions, the parking, don't have to build it, et cetera. And now that I am 89 years old, I cannot believe I said this, but I think about it every now and then. I said, over my dead body, <laughs> you will get the deal in San Francisco. You are building the stadium. You are paying for it, and I'm going to tax it. And I said, if I walk, you guys are dead. And so, as I say, I look back. I would never say that today. <laughs> so anyway, to end the story part of the story, the story goes on and on with referendums and votes, and we didn't know who was paying for the opposite side. My mother had to go to the meetings. My mother was great. She could talk in. She could be Irish. She could be German. She could be anything. And she'd wear sometimes a baseball hat, sometimes she'd wear a cap, and she would go to the opposition's meetings. We never figured out who, who was paying for that. But finally, we did after we had them, and we found out it was the guy who owned the San Diego, chart, uh, San Diego team, Smith. Guy named Smith. Imagine the guy named Smith, yeah. Anyway, he's, he's paying for, he is paying for the opposition. And we, they were really professional, Simon. We never could figure it out, but he wanted a baseball team, we found out. But we had to go to a referendum. We had to do a lot of stuff. Anyway, I'll tell you, uh, I wish I didn't love the Dodgers as much as I do. And I'm so glad that you're all here to hear some of the history of it. But it really, really was important to this city. It was the first time in the history of our city when Vince Scully, who could have been governor, could have been mayor, could have been anything, Vinny was so loved, and rightly so. He's the most wonderful man you ever would like to spend time with. And all of the thing you want to have a beer, you would have two beers with him. He's so good. Anyway, he's, <laughs> he's very, very special. And Vinny said, and now the first year, we first year, they're here, we come seventh. And as I walked down in the Coliseum, I got booed regularly with O'Malley. <laughs> and I thought, why did I get into this? And so anyway, the second year, we and Vinny said, and now we go to Chicago. And it was the first time in my city that the valley, they started tooting horns in the west side, in the east side. And I felt my city had seen the battle, they'd seen the, what we'd gone through, that my city came together for something. And I tell you, I was really proud at that moment. So that's a little bit of the story. I think we should give Rosie Another a ovation. round of applause for pulling it off.
we have we we wanted to make sure that we had a, a little time for audience questions and so if somebody has a question we have a a wireless mic and we look forward to hearing what is on your mind hi my name is gwen perry i have a question for mr landro um a few months ago actually about six or seven months ago I was in a car with a friend, and there was an uh, announcement made regarding Mike Trout. You might be aware of this, uh, so can you educate us all about, I know where I'm going with this is because you're a Dodger. So I want some clarification. The, actually, I won't even ask that question. Just tell us your first memorable moment that you'll never forget with Vin Scully. <laughs> There was, I heard I heard two different questions in there, <laughs> but uh, what? Uh, do, okay, Scully. Let's, let's let's go with let's go with, with the second one, the Dodgers. Um, as I mentioned before, growing up, listening to Vince Scully announce these the, the Dodgers, you know, playing, you know, announcing the Dodger games, man, and oh, and I, I was always wondering if I ever could be good enough to be a, a major league baseball player. And um, <clears throat> when I did get drafted and went professionally, and I I was fortunate enough to not spend that long a time in the minor leagues. I only spent five months in the minor leagues, and next thing I know, I was in the major leagues. But I was in the major leagues with the California Angels. So I was just feeling like I was just in the major leagues, and then – I got traded to the Twins. Then I got traded to the Dodgers. And when I came to the Dodgers, and, back, you know, back then, and they always had the they had the uh, speakers all around the stadium. You know, there, there was times on the field you can actually hear Vince Scully announcing the game. Okay? And p because a lot of people had transistors radios in the, in the stadium, and I would be out there in the outfield, man, and I can hear Vince Scully announcing the game and everything, you know. And and I'll never forget the first time uh, I'm, I'm in Dodger Stadium in, in, in uniform and first game out there on the field, and I heard Vince Scully announce my name, uh, you know, in center field, batting second, Ken – Landro, and when I heard when I heard him announce that, I was that's what I said. You know what? I have made it to the major leagues. <laughs> and when he and when he missed the ball, I used to yell at him. <laughs> there wasn't that many misses. I can I can count them on I can count them on one hand. We have a question on the on the side here. Hi guys, good evening. My name is uh, Hiccups the Clown. Uh, <laughs> I am a clown. Uh, this question is for Ms. Rosalind. Um, I understand that uh, when the Brooklyn Dodgers were in Brooklyn, they had a mascot, a clown named Mr. Emmett Kelly. And I know that he came to LA for a couple of games at the Coliseum. And I was wondering why the Dodgers never, ever, ever had another mascot that to represent them i know that emma kelly represented them in like the bum the bum looking clown not the happy one like this one <laughs> so i was just wondering uh what happened to emmett kelly and why was uh, he why didn't he continue being the mascot for the dodgers emmett kelly's on my shoulder right now My my first mother's my first Mother's Day after the Dodgers were here, my husband had this pin made for me, and it's really special. And when we got them, and during the battle, we had a bunch of cartoons with the bum. There was uh, the great cartoonist, uh, Willard Bond. huh? Willard Bond. Well, not Willard Bond, but another one is for, of Carl Ob uh, Hubenthal from the L.A. Times. Some of you remember, he was a Pulitzer Prize winner. And we had the lot of the, the bums, and we talked about it, and we talked about the possibility of having an angel, the, the, sometime for, I never know why, but the 
Angel was part of L.A. It was part of the Alvero Street. It was part of something. And then we also thought that maybe we would have a, 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 a Latino because of the L.A. was founded on Alvero Street, the city, etc. We did talk about it, but it never took, obviously, we're still, I don't know if anybody's looking now, but <laughs> anyway, we've never, we never got to it, but I love the bum idea, and uh, we ha I, if you ever visited my house, I have cartoons during that fight with the bum picture after picture about the bum having tears leaving Brooklyn. I wanted him to smile, but anyway, <laughs> it was tough getting them here for Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah, Marano Nelson, I have had 61 years working as a food vendor in the Dodger Stadium, and I uh, really wondered if Ken was working a uh, Dodger at the time, Jim Gilliam was third baseman, and uh, uh, Gil Hodges was first baseman. And I, I was going to retire a year ago, uh, two years ago, and I saw on the board saying, All-Star Game 2020, which I'm advertising on my cap. So I decided, well, Ron, make the last year you work. Uh, 2020, and I'm 87 now, and I'll be 88 in February. This one's for uh, for Mark. Uh, there's been a lot of talk over the years, and, it, and it's in its place, we have the Ring of Honor now. Why was um, Don uh, Newcomb and Fernando Valenzuela's number never retired? Well, no, not yet. Um, they start to retire the numbers in 72, and they are able to have Jackie and Sandy and Roy. And then some of the retired numbers, they retired Alston's number before he gets into the Hall of Fame. And then Gilliam's number is retired because he passes away right before the 78 World Series. And at that point, I think they realized that they would use the Hall of Fame as the standard for to retire. Now, we have some other Brooklyn ball players, uh, Zach Wheat, um, others, Dazzy Vance, who aren't associated with the number. Um, and the hardest thing to do is to try to justify, if you do one, what about the other? Because so many people... You've got Gil Hodges, you've got uh, Fernando, you've got Garvey. Garvey's on the ballot, and right now it's just hard to be able to say, well, he's not in the Hall of Fame, but we'll retire this number. But then what do you say to the person that in that era was worthy in terms of uh, who they were? And so it's easier for the club just to let the Hall of Fame say, you're in the Hall of Fame. So Hodges, if you, the, the, the sad thing about Hodges is, He's knocking on the door when he passes away spring training of 72. If you look at the vote totals of Gil Hodges and Duke Snyder, it's totally opposite. It's like a seesaw, and it's kind of like out of sight, out of mind, because Drysdale and Snyder become broadcasters, and then they get elected later in their 15-year period. Um, but Hodges, you know, he's so deserving because as a player and also the 69 Mets, and it just gets so political because then you've got, and I mean political from the Hall of Fame point of view, so many people say, well, that's enough. Drysdale only won 209 games. Pee Wee gets in, they put in Rizzuto, and then other clubs are saying, well, what about us? And so it's a good problem to have as far as having so many great players and so many great Hall of Famers. And on the way to the clubhouse, you've got the plaques for the Hall of Fame executives, the Hall of Fame broadcasters, the broken guys that didn't have numbers. Uh, so right now the easiest thing to do is just to keep it at the 10 with Gilliam being the exception, but in the, in the organization for 40 plus years and just wait. If Garvey gets the call, if Hodges gets the call, uh, then it becomes retired. I would like some tribute in that ballpark to the O'Malley family. Uh, 
they were the first, and believe it or not, for 15 years, we never had a raise in prices or the food or whatever, but baseball was their only business. They weren't in chewing gum, and they weren't in trucks, and they weren't in everything else, and that, and that whole field was not a bunch of signs, etc. but I hope before the Peter O'Malley leaves us, that uh, we have something to recognize the beautiful family that started it would be very nice. We have uh, one more question right here in the front. Y yes, Mark, could you speak to uh, the Japanese garden that was out beyond center field, why it was installed and why was it taken down? Actually, it wasn't taken down per se. We've got a Japanese lantern out there and historically, uh, the opening day, 1962, Satoru Suzuki, who was a sports writer, and he had coordinated the Dodgers' uh, trips to Japan in 56 and 66, and later um, other teams as well. He comes to opening day, 1962, and decides we're going to have a gift on behalf of Japanese baseball. So he commissions this huge lantern, and it takes a very long time to build. And ironically, it arrives September the 8th, 1965, the day before Colfax's perfect game. And so you see early photos, and they had it beyond center field, and then uh, the way the, the ballpark was structured, it went beyond the fence but still on the property, and so it's still used for special events. And the great thing about that lantern in that area, if you think about it, it's a reminder. It, it arrives in 1965, and back then, you don't have Japanese players coming to the major leagues. You had Masanori Murakami from the Giants who came only because he was a single-A prospect. They call him up in September of 64. There's a big argument between the U.S. and Japan baseball in terms of where should he play. So from 65 until Nomo in 95, there's no Japanese baseball. But that monument is there, and it's still there. We just hope uh, that we'd have an opportunity to either move it and to, so fans will be able to see it better um, but it's been on the property since 65. Uh, this message is for Ms. Finney. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of stories that were on the cutting room floor. Was there any story that didn't make the, the movie uh, that you could tell us about? There were lots, and we're hoping maybe we'll, if this show is successful, maybe we'll do another one. But um, there is some bonus material on the DVD, and it'll also be on PBS Passport. But um, one of those is uh, a story that, that Roz tells where she went down to Vero Beach, um, and she was, um, you know, sort of hobnobbing around with the players and somehow managed to get herself uh, uh, out there on the field, and Don Drysdale was pitching to her, and of course, she hit the ball off Don Drysdale, because <laughs> she's Roz, <laughs> so. Let me just add a moment to that. <laughs> uh, I, was, I was on the field, and I would have breakfast, oh, Vero Beach was so much fun, and I, I would have, you know, breakfast with Tommy Lasorda, and I got sometimes to do the signals as well when they played. We sat right behind him, and he said, someday, I." He lets me do that, but he's going to have, I'm going to get a player killed because I love to, you know, do strange things. <laughs> and, and so anyway, um, he, uh, uh, he said to me. What, what, About hitting Drysdale. Up Drysdale. I forgot. I got so many stories. <laughs> anyway, uh, Drysdale, I, I called my husband and I said, I just hit Don Drysdale's pitching. My husband says, you don't drink, you don't, t you don't take dope. <laughs> he said, I don't believe you. And he said, you've made this up. And I said, I didn't make it up. I did it. And so he says, and I said, I have a camera picture of it. And, a, and a, in those days, what is those things? Well, what you put into the TV, you don't do it anymore. Uh, Oh, a video, video. Oh, I'm a typical, I'm a typical 89. I'm terrible with all that stuff. But anyway, so I said I'm bringing it home to prove to you, and he says okay. So I finally, I came home. It was a very short trip, and I 
he doesn't say hello. He said, where's that video? <laughs> and he said, I don't believe it. And I said, we're going to play the video. And so he says, okay. He said, I can't wait to see this video. And you know what? Don pitched to me like this. <laughs> and I hit it. <laughs> So I, I hit Don Drysdale. <laughs> well, just like Kirk Gibson, we have a walk-off with Roz Wyman. So thank you all very much. That concludes the panel, and we're going to have a reception. And thank you again to, to PBS for just this wonderful show and this wonderful opportunity. And don't forget to tell all your friends who will be stuck on a rainy Thursday night. 7 and 8.30, and make that pledge so you can get your DVD. Bonus footage. Oh, and I, I need to thank Mark, uh, uh, per, uh, whatever this is, in a public forum, because I was an absolute pest the past six months. I, I can't tell you how many random phone calls this man got with obscure questions, and can you find me a photo of this? And So all of the Dodgers were fantastic, John Chapper, everybody, but Mark was the real hero. Mark Langell was excited to be part of such an ambitious project. It's an amazing experience because I grow up as a fan. I go to my very first game when I'm seven years old, and now suddenly I've gone through this time machine, working, living with this club, and PBS comes along and says, we'd like to chronicle 60 years in Los Angeles. And it was, in a way, it was like watching home movies because I've followed this franchise and I've spent so much of my life I wouldn't say rooting because it's more of a lifestyle. Whether it's win or lose, I'm always going to be interested in this franchise that originally came from Brooklyn. And I'm so fortunate that I was able to find something that I loved at a young age, accidentally thought Dodger Stadium was one of the greatest places in the world, and it turned out I was right. Ken Landro lived every kid's dream of growing up and playing for his hometown heroes. It's truly a dream come true, you know, and it's, it's pretty amazing that, you know, growing up, um, coming to a Dodger game and, and, and looking down on that field and, and going, God, I wish I could get down here on that field. And then, you know, later on in life, you know, it, it, becomes, it becomes true. Oh, man, it's just, it's just amazing. So set your device to record Dodger stories. Six decades in L.A. for Thanksgiving Thursday, November 28th at 8 p.m. because you'll want to watch it again. Oh, and don't forget the peanuts, Cracker Jack, hot chocolate, and a couple of Kleenex. Lunch with Legends sends special thanks to KCET's Director of Communications, J.P. Shields, Mark Langell of the Dodgers, Manny Pacheco of KNX 1070 News Radio, and co-producer of Lunch with Legends, Tina Sanders. Executive producer of Lunch with Legends is Maxine Stowers. This is Lou Stowers for Lunch with Legends and ASE Media.